We are here to worship our Creator and our Redeemer. We are overwhelmed as we contemplate His creative power. And when He created the human race in Adam and Eve, we had no part in it. He did what He chose to do. He wanted to create a people who would be akin to him, created in his own image. But we know that through the rebellion in heaven, this planet joined ranks with the enemy. And here we exist as sinners. The text in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 leaves us vividly aware that what the plight of humanity is is that the offense of one as it says in verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we are here now, all of us, and death has passed upon all of us, and we are all sinners. However, if you read verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We live in hope. Here we are. And there's many, many a young person today who's taken their life because they see no hope. But for those who see the di dilemma in the, of the human race and see the plight of their own condition, there is hope because by the righteousness of one, by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. We can live in hope. And if we turn there to Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25, Romans 8, verse 24 and 25, <clears throat> it says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Our salvation is something that we hope for. And we are saved by hope. Obviously, our salvation is not yet completed. Our Creator is our Redeemer, our Re-Creator. And he is at work recreating us. He's not finished yet. And we must patiently wait. A person who goes and cuts his life short is impatient. We must continue to patiently wait in hope. That's how we will be saved. And so, God is still at work to produce 
a perfect character in us. Fitting us to be fit citizens in the heavenly world. And he is going to change this mortal body so that it will live eternally. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 2 and notice how the fact of his ongoing creative work, recreative work, is addressed here in Ephesians chapter 2. Reading there verse 12 and 13. Sorry, verses uh, 10. Verse 10, that's the one I'm after. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So when God created us, he had ordained that all the human race should walk within the good works that he had planned. But they had fa failed. Now we are his workmanship now, created in Christ Jesus unto those good works. Now. He is working he is creating, he is recreating in Jesus Christ. And in this work of his recreating, this time, we have a part. Before, when he created us and we were born to sinful parents, and we are born with a sinful propensity, a, a propensity of disobedience, with that within us, we had no choice. We were born that way. But now, in God's recreation activity, we are, we have a part to play. We read it here in Romans chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Romans chapter 2, where it says it beautifully, verses 6 and 7. Where it says, God will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Can you see here that God will render eternal life to those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality? We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. We must patiently continue to be part of this work. And in this work of God creating in us his perfect character and ultimately a recreation of our mortal body, we are, according to those words, patiently to continue well-doing. So therefore... In our, in our recreation, we are participating with our Creator, with our Recreator. Let's go over there to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. <coughs> Wherefore, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Can you see this beautiful cooperation together in this text? God is working in us, recreating us. And while God is working in us, what is our participation? We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I read it here from Acts of the Apostles, page 482. A beautiful rendition of this scripture. Page 482 of Acts of the Apostles, there in paragraph 2. It says, The work of gaining salvation is one of co partnership, a joint operation. There is to be cooperation between God and the repentant sinner. This is necessary for the formation of right principles in the character. Man is to make earnest efforts to overcome that which hinders him from attaining to perfection. There is something that hinders us from attaining to perfection. We are to make earnest efforts to overcome that. But he is wholly dependent upon God for success. Human effort of itself is not sufficient. Without the aid of divine power, it avails nothing. God works and man works. Resistance of temptation must come from man, who must draw his power from God. On the one side, there is infinite wisdom, compassion, and power. On the other, weakness, sinfulness, absolute helplessness. God wishes us, this is the next paragraph, God wishes us to have the mastery over ourselves. But he cannot help us without our consent and cooperation. God is recreating us. Before we had no choice in it. And when people have said to me, I wouldn't ask to be born. I have said, all right. But now you have an opportunity to ask to be born again and to ask to be born in a better situation. Now you have a choice. Something much better. And so indeed, God can recreate us, but he can't without my cooperation. And we are here to worship such a God. A delight. Think about it. Think about this. We are here to worship. We are worshiping a God who says, all right, you want to make a decision? I want to recreate you. Will you cooperate with me? Shall we come and work together? Isn't that precious? 
What a delight. To unite together with God the majesty of the universe to link up together with his almighty power and capability and interact with him as he forms within us the similitude of the divine. Wow. Are you picking up the true sense of worship? I'll read it again. Beautifully portrayed in the testimony of Jesus. This comes from uh, Manuscript Releases, volume 18, page 163, there in paragraph 4. The Lord is doing a great work in the earth. Now follow carefully. With intense interest he is examining every man's fitness of character to associate with the sinless angels and with the redeemed family in heaven. <laughs> what is God's mode of interest? Intense interest. He is looking upon you and me, children, young people. God is looking with intense interest on developing in you this beautiful character. To dwell with the sinless angels. To associate with them and with the redeemed family in heaven. Not one of the ransomed host will be disposed to begin a rebellion similar to the one that Satan began before the creation of the race. There won't be any more disposition of that nature. The Lord gives men and women probationary time in which to acquaint themselves with his terms of salvation. They are given opportunity to unite with him as laborers together with God. <laughs> laborers together with God to do what? to mold their characters after the similitude of the divine wow apprentices in recreation that's it. Apprentices under the recreator's expertise. Isn't that something to worship him for? Indeed, our worship this hour is going to be occupied with this in reality and application. To actually worship him here intelligently, in spirit and in truth, to grasp the part that I am playing and the part that he is playing in this cooperation of recreation. The context of our scripture reading. Remember what the scripture reading was? It said, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That was our scripture reading. Let's read the context of it and observe the actual information that is provided there for our participation as we participate with God as apprentices in his work of recreation. There in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. <clears throat> this is now the material 
that we are to apply to our activity. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Here it is. God has given us the material by which the divine nature can be imparted to us. How was it? His grace and peace being multiplied unto us, how? Through the knowledge of God. What was it that we gained the knowledge of God by? through all the pure doctrines of his word, whether it be prophecy, whether it be instruction, whether it be correction, whatever you have studied on the sanctuary message, everything is a revelation of the knowledge of God. And as these doctrines all become vivid to our understanding, that knowledge is the knowledge by which grace and peace is multiplied unto us and the knowledge of Jesus, our Lord. And so according as his divine power that has been displayed by that knowledge hath given unto us, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So this knowledge, this doctrinal repertoire, this, this scheme of truth that has been brought to us in the doctrines of God's word, through that are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And those promises, not only in words, but in the very intonation of all those doctrines, there is a promise that by these promises what should happen? You might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Can you see what is your part in this beautiful program? If you do not open and I do not open my heart to the pure doctrines of God's word, can I go any further? I can't even get the divine nature in the first place. Because this is the material that is conveyed to us here. The knowledge, and that's what Jesus said in John 17 verse 3. This is life eternal. What? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. To know him. And you can only know him through the, through the display of the pure doctrines of God's word. That accumulated knowledge and its associated promises create inside of us the embryo of the divine. The divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. Which then, according to scripture, we are to diligently nurture, desiring the sincere milk of the word that what? You may grow thereby and then moving on from baby to adulthood by reason of use of the scriptures isn't that profound and so indeed I read here from our high calling 
page 37, paragraph 5, it says, Do not merely assent to the truth. That beautiful truth is there not only for saying, Oh yes, it's true. I can see it's right. Do not merely assent to the truth and fail to be a doer of the words of Christ. The truth must be applied to self. And as we apply the truth, without applying it to self, we will become proud because we know the truth. All the other people don't know what we know. And it's a waste of the truth. The truth is there to create the divine nature. The truth must be applied to self. It must bring men and women who receive it to the rock, that they may fall upon the rock and be broken. You see, God's going to recreate. So first of all, before he can recreate, he's got to break us in pieces and put us back together again. So let's cooperate. Let the truth do it. Then Jesus can do what? When it's all broken. Then Jesus can mold and fashion their characters after his divine character. If we would listen to his voice, we must let silence reign in the heart. Is it silent in our heart? Or are there so many thoughts that I occupy myself in that I can't even hear the creative power? Remember when God spoke, it was done? So I must now open my ears to the powerful cre creating work inside of me. There must be silence in the heart. The clamors of self, its pretension. Its lusts must be rebuked and we must put on the robe of humility and take our place as humble learners in the school of Christ. So there it indeed is that we are to do more than study the truth. Once we know the truth and we know we've got the pure truth, we've been told what the pure truth is, then we are to go further, not merely assent to it, but be doers of the word so that I can fall apart and God can recreate me. Break on the rock. And this thought continues in uh, the book Volume 2 of Manuscript Releases, page 95. There in paragraph 1 it says, The benefit, the benefit that truth is to us depends not so much on the knowledge we gain by study as on the purity of our purpose and the earnestness of our faith. So this doesn't wipe away the importance of study, but what, is the, what does the benefit of the truth depend on? It depends on our purpose and the earnestness of our faith. Merely to read the instruction given in the Word of God is not enough. We are to read with meditation and prayer, filled with an earnest desire to be helped and blessed. Now follow this very carefully. This is actually the answer of what I must do in participating with God. The truth that he imparts to me is the, is the material by which he creates in me the new creature, the divine nature. 
It is the means by which, through that knowledge, I may be a partaker of that divine na knowledge, of that divine nature. Merely to read about that is not sufficient. We are to read, and I go on quoting, we are to read with meditation and prayer, filled with an earnest desire. How intense was God? With great intensity, and we must with an earnest, intense desire be, be helped, a desire to be helped and blessed. In other words, instead of me running in and doing it myself, I must be prepared to be helped and blessed. I must be a humble apprentice. An apprentice does as he is told by the master tradesman. He doesn't just go along and do, and when I was bricklaying and, uh, as an as a apprentice, if I did something, my own idea, <laughs> my father would really let me have it. But God doesn't let you have it. He says, please, if you want to succeed, you've got to be ready to be helped and blessed. And it goes on to say, helped and blessed. And the truth we learn must be applied to the daily experience. Those who have a true realization of the subtlety of Satan's devices for these last days will walk with fear and trembling in great humility at every step seeking divine guidance. Why are we going to be fear and trembling? Not because we're doubting. We are in fear and trembling because we know how subtle Satan is. And so I will be in great humility at every step knowing that the devil is far more powerful than me. Every moment. And as I humbly and tremblingly move on, I will seek for guidance to the recreator who knows how to help me through this. Angels of God, I go on reading, angels of God will instruct them. Wonderful. The Holy Spirit opens to the humble and contrite in heart the rich treasures of truth. A fountain has been opened for Judah and Jerusalem in which we may wash and be clean. He who will purify his soul by obeying the truth will see and appreciate the love and mercy with which God has strewn the pathway of his children. He will realize that the paths of human devising lead to eternal ruin. So the apprentice knows, I've got to be ever so careful not to jump in where angels fear to tread, to be very humble, broken for the Lord to put me back together again. And I can't put myself together. But I can follow the instructions of the Recreator. Are we getting that point? I can follow the instructions as the apprentice of the molding of the character. I can follow the instruction of the divine worker and the help of the angels this is the delicate careful understanding of how we are going to be saved to secure our salvation and what did we read examining God's word those doctrines with meditation and prayer and applying it to our experience Every word of God we are to live by. We are to be diligent to make our calling and election sure in this way. And again, in the book Evangelism, we read on, page 291. Evangelism, page 291. Here is the beautiful application of 
the importance of the, of the material of the doctrine. In paragraph 1, 291, we must have more than an intellectual belief in the truth. We must have it, but we must have more than that. Many of the Jews were convinced that Jesus was the Son of God, but they were too proud and ambitious to surrender. They decided to resist the truth and they maintained their opposition. They did not receive into the heart the truth as it is in Jesus. When truth is held as truth only by the conscience, when the heart is not stimulated and made receptive, only the mind is affected. The intellect is only affected. But the heart is standing by as a cool judge. Yeah, I can see that's true. Mm, I still want to do this. Um, yeah, uh, God will save me. All those kind of whisperings of the natural man. But, but, when the truth is received as truth by the heart, it has passed through the conscience and has captivated the soul with its pure principles. And how do you take it with the heart? I read it there. We meditate upon it, we pray, and we place ourselves under, surrenderingly under that so it says there, you become captivated with its pure principles. It is placed in the heart. That's how it's done. It is placed in the heart by doing what we've just read there, by the Holy Spirit who reveals its beauty to the mind that its transforming power may be seen in the character. So by reflecting Christ, by reflecting and meditating upon Christ in all the doctrines, in all the prophecies, and you saw me sharing that two we over the past two weeks, the prophecies and the prophecy of Christ, how important those prophecies were to believe and to understand the pure doctrine within those prophecies, to see him and to behold Jesus as we see him more than merely hanging on the cross through those prophecies, but as we read Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We heard him say that on the cross, but there you can see what's going on in his mind. And in Psalm 69, and in Psalm 40. And you appreciate what the Apostle Peter meant when he said in 1 Peter 2.24, as you meditate on it, the Holy Spirit takes it and applies it to your experience. And what is my experience? My sin is ever before me. My incapability of doing it right is constantly thwarting my efforts. And as I behold Jesus with all my sufferings, with all my experiences played out in front of me in those prophecies, there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, the reality of his own self bearing our sins in his own body to the tree, marginal, that we being dead, to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. You can see the operative activity of this truth. You look at Jesus as he says there in Psalms 22 and 69 and 40 and, and Chronicles. Is it nothing to you? He is pleading. He is wanting us to absorb and as we absorb that, I fall to pieces. 
my true condition becomes really big to me and I see that my condition can be put back together again correctly. By his stripes I am healed. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 becomes the reality in living application. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 For he God hath made him Christ to be what? To be sin for us. We saw it there. This is not just an announcement. We see it in the prophecies. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why? For a purpose. That as I behold this and meditate upon it, I might be able to make connection and participate that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. What a promise. We can become partakers of the divine nature by that promise. We will understand it only as the doctrines are absorbed by prayer and meditation. And as these beautiful quotes express themselves here in, in Desire of Ages, page 756, just one sentence. He, the sin bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice and for thy sake becomes Sin itself. Oh. Wow. For thy sake. Don't just accept it as doctrine. <laughs> Let it go right in. He became sin itself. Again, in Signs of the Times, the 30th of June, 1895. He clothed himself in our filthy garments that we might wear the spotless robe of his righteousness which was woven in the loom of heaven. Oh, what a Savior. The question is, do you really believe it? And that's the problem. Livingly believe it. Not just say, yeah, yeah, that's good. But make it your own. Believe it and act on it. And here is the further consideration of this apprenticeship. Yes, to believe it and practice it. If I have received the truth in that knowledge What does Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and 11 continue to go on with? Second Peter chapter 1, where it says that now that I have come so far and I have received this promise, and I believe it, what must I do about it? It says, besides this, giving all diligence. Uh -huh. This is what our sermon is about. Securing your salvation. Give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> so there is something for me to do. Yes, indeed. To exercise the faith that I have gained from the doctrines as I meditated about them. And here it is. Believe it and act on it. This is virtue. Faith has been born. Now I must exercise it. There it is in heavenly places. Page 111. Paragraph 4. Behold Christ. Dwell upon his love and mercy. This will fill the soul with abhorrence for all that is sinful and will inspire it with an intense desire for the righteousness of Christ. What? The intensity that God has for my personal development, remember I read that in the beginning, with intensity he's watching, I will now pick up on that intensity that he has. I will be filled with an intense desire for the righteousness of Christ. The more clearly we see the Savior, the more clearly shall we discern our defects and of character. Yes, we will discern them. Confess your sins to Christ and with true contrition of soul. Confess and with true contrition of soul cooperate with him by putting these sins away. Don't just put them away because they're wrong. Put them away because you're cooperating with him in your life. Believe that they are pardoned. Here it is now. Do we believe that Jesus took my wretched condition? Do I believe that by, by him doing that, he is intensely desirous that I actually act in total contrition so that they are pardoned? The promise is positive. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the promise. Be assured that the word of God will not fail. That's his part. He won't fail. The only thing is that I mustn't fail. I must be assured. He has promised. He who has promised is faithful. It is as much your duty to believe that God will fulfill his word and forgive you as it is to confess your sin. So after you've confessed your sin, do you believe that he has forgiven you? My sin is ever before me, says, says David. But that sin that is ever before me continues to cause me to rely upon his forgiveness. And it's a constant activity of a personal touch with the divine content of the recreation. It goes on to say in paragraph 2 and 3, how many there are, how many there are who go through life under a cloud of condemnation. They do not believe God's word. Do you go through under a cloud of condemnation? It is your duty to believe and apply as God is recreating you. They do not believe God's word. They have no faith that he will do as he has said. They do not believe it. And therefore they carry this ugh. Many who long to see others resting in the pardoning love of Christ do not rest in it for themselves. That's why when I went through my terrible experience, the Lord said, what did you tell others? Oh, this applies to me now. 
but how can they possibly lead others to show simple childlike faith in the Heavenly Father when they measure His love by their feelings? Let us trust God's word implicitly, remembering that we are his sons and daughters and apprentices together with that. Let us train ourselves to believe his word. We hurt the heart of Christ by doubting. We hurt the heart of Christ by doubting. When he has given such evidence of his love, he laid down his life to save us. He was intense, remember, and he's now just as intense. He says to us, come unto me and I will give you rest. Do you believe he will do as he has said? Do you believe it? Then, after you have complied with the conditions, carry on no longer, carry no longer the burden of your sins. Let it roll upon the Saviour. Trust yourself with him. Has he not promised to give you rest? But to many he is obliged to say sorrowfully, You will not come to me that you might have life. He the creator, he the recreator, wants me to cooperate. He wants me to believe. Won't you come to me and let me do it? That's my part, and he will do the rest. I've got to believe in him. I've got to believe in Sister White writes in this day with God, page 261, paragraph 3. Why do we not have consciousness of sins forgiven? Why? It is because we are unbelieving. If I still have, am not free of my consciousness of sins of my consciousness of my sin that I still hold a consciousness of sins unforgiven I am unbelieving full stop so that's the first point to believe that all my sins have been forgiven as I in contrition take hold of of this beautiful sacrifice of Jesus that he with my sins has died and given me his righteousness. So important. Then comes the next point. And that next point is introduced here in That I May Know Him, page 227. That I may know him, page 227, paragraph 2 and 3. Why are we so weak in faith? We are so faithless, so unbelieving, that the Lord cannot do for us those things which he longs to do. He's intense, remember? He longs to. There are doubts in our minds that are very saddening and very difficult to dispel. These doubts that bow down the soul, we should each one bravely face. What should you do with your doubts? Face them. And tell the soul that we must conquer them at once. Make no delay. These doubts, for, sorry, make no delay, for there can be no peace where faith is lost. Add to your faith virtue. So here is the exercise on the point of faith. We need not express these doubts. We need not express these doubts, for they may cause some poor soul to stumble. But examine them in the light of God's word. Then talk them over with Jesus. Here is the participation. Talk them over with Jesus with his word of promise in your hand and pray for their removal. Tell the Lord, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let not doubt be placed in a comfortable easy chair. It is a dangerous guest. 
when it is left to rankle in the mind and counteract faith. Genuine faith is life. It's the divine ingredient. Genuine faith is life. Eternal life. And where there is life, there is growth. The life which Jesus imparts cannot but grow more and more abundantly. So many people are there grappling around on the very first step of the ladder. Shall I believe? Shall I not? Shall I believe? Shall I not? Oh, but my sins are too bad. Oh, but the, my brother's sins are so bad, they keep on affecting me. Oh, but this, oh, but that, oh, but the other. Doubt and doubt and excuses and excuses which we make if we will look at God's word correctly. We will see that. And we will, in contrition, break before the Lord. And then we will grow. The development will take place. And that's what I said. This is where we must go on now. And in going on, what must I do in the work of God creating in me the recreated beautiful molding of his divine character? It's there in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 15. Where he says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. He just delineated his experience to know the death of Jesus and his sufferings and so on, which we've just covered. He says, but I haven't attained yet, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Jesus has got his mind to bring about his end result. And I now, Apostle Paul says, I will follow that I may apprehend, that I may take in, apprehend, make it my own, to apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You can't, for, you can't forget if you haven't believed that your sin has been forgiven. But once you know that your sin has been forgiven, you can forget the past. Oh, how many people bring up the past. You can forget the past and press on, reaching forth unto those things which are before. We can learn from the past, but we are not to let the past burden us. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let, well, notice the calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if any, in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even that unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So what I have already attained, I am to walk by, and the thing that I haven't attained yet, I will press on to reach for perfection. And that is the person who is perfect. That's what he wrote there. So did you notice here that there is a disposition now the Lord has broken in, he's broken and shattered me, he has caused me to confess, he has caused me to realize, oh, he is such a loving God, and I have a disposition, a disposition, what did I read about a disposition before? Not one of the ransomed host will be disposed to begin a rebellion similar to the one that Satan began. Disposed, a disposition. That's what I read before. So, 
There we have a disposition that is created by God by believing in the beautiful work of his redemption story in Jesus Christ. A disposition. And here it is. In that I may know him. Page 229. If I have this disposition that I love God, I love to obey him because he's created that desire in me and I have opened my heart to it. As I do this, I need not, as it goes to say here, this is um, the fifth line up from page 229 at the bottom of the paragraph. We need not be discouraged. Jesus came to our world to bring divine power to man that through his grace we might be transformed into his likeness. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service. And he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. What must you have? You must have a disposition. And we've just dealt with how God creates that disposition. If I will believe and if I fulfill my duty in confessing, in contrition, and as I am in contrite spirit, as I am totally given over to that, I have now a heart. I have the divine nature, which is a disposition to obey God and make efforts towards that end. And with that disposition, Jesus accepts that and your effort of your best service. And with that disposition, he will then make up the deficiency with his own divine merit. We are under a beautiful, worshipful appreciation here, aren't we? And we read it in our Sabbath school lesson. Desire of Ages, page 352. Right at the bottom of the page. Our infirmities may be many. Our sins and mistakes grievous. But... The grace of God is for all who seek it with contrition. The power of omnipotence is enlisted in behalf of those who trust in God. Do you? Do you really trust? Really? If I trust that his promise that my sins were in his body so that I might have his righteousness, that he was made sin. If I trust that and no longer hang on to those condemnations of the past, if I trust that while I have no disposition to want to disobey him, that I have a disposition to love to obey him, but I've made some terrible mistakes, and I may still fall once again. Grievous mistakes. Grievous sins. And, th and I think, well, that's just too bad now. I should have known better, but I still did it. Then, the contrition that comes back because my heart is, has a predisposition a disposition of wanting to follow God nonetheless. I failed miserably, but I still want Him. 
I want to obey him. If that is still there, no matter how severe your sin has been, he will place his merits in the place of your sin. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? The knowledge of Jesus is the knowledge that brings light into our heart. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He who brings light out of darkness, that's what's creation. He has shined in our hearts to bring the light of the glory of Jesus Christ in our hearts, in the face of Jesus. In Christ, our eternal life is secure. What must I do to secure my salvation? To exercise myself the way that we have just carefully let the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy delineate it to us. He has mapped out, Jesus himself has mapped out the apprenticeship procedure for us. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Let us earnestly, diligently, and as intensely as our Heavenly Father is looking upon us and is working for us, let us participate with Him and thus secure our salvation in molding our character in the similitude of the divine. Amen.